Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course. So today a theorem which is related to the so-called group number function. So I'm a little group number function here. So I'm counting the number of groups. Kind of an interesting question. So groups are generalizations, if you want, or mathematical versions of symmetries. And you kind of want to count symmetries. It seems to be, at least to me, like a reasonable goal. Turns out that, well, hmm, maybe it's not as reasonable as it looks like. It's actually pretty wild and not much is known about this function. It's very, very random. I'm going to into some details in a second. Uh, I think a lot of mathematicians would like to know more about this function, but it's not um, really not right now in the focus of research because it's kind of too random, it's sort of too complicated to, to say much about it, which is um, a bit surprising first, but if you really look at it, you want to classify symmetries in some sense. Mm, that sounds a bit too hard. At least uh, I think it sounds a bit too hard. Uh, anyway, the, the fun is, and that's kind of the theorem or kind of collection of theorems, collection of little statements for today, um, that you can actually tell a little bit at least, you can say a little bit about this function, which I find, um, well, at first sight, as I said, it's probably like, oh, we can probably they can do that. That function is probably controllable in some sense. Nah, it's not really. Um, and then you get really, really like, mm, there's probably not much we can say. And then there are those theorems, which are kind of uh, little spikes in randomness, kind of little patterns in randomness. And that's always kind of very, very exciting and makes you very, very happy. But let's get going, I, I think, right? So, um, so what are groups? Well, I don't want to write down the definition of a group, but here comes a way to think about it. And it works pretty well for today's video, actually. So groups are kind of abstract version of symmetries. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine the following. So what is the number? Well, this is a number, of course, but um, this is just the abstract perception of a number, right? So uh, in the real world, a number can represent many things. It's like discounting. It can represent three apples or three whatever, three videos or whatever, you know, it's just really an incarnation of the abstract concept of a number. That's how I would like to think about it. So a number a priori is something abstract. It doesn't really exist, whatever that means, not, not going into any philosophical discussions here, really just, it's an abstract entity, right? Somewhere three years, it doesn't really exist. Let's just say, but it kind of, ex it exists in incarnations and kind of everywhere. Three apples, three videos, whatever. Three mistakes in three videos, whatever. Oh, well, maybe that's actually nine mistakes. I don't know. Anyway, you get the point, right? So there's an abstract uh, incarnation, which kind of really makes sense in our minds only in some sense. And there's a, a, a real world incarnation like three apples. And the same is true with groups. There's some abstract way to think about groups. Um, and that's what mathematicians most of the time do. If you don't know what this notation means, it doesn't really matter. There's some abstract way to think about groups, which you might see in classes on group theory or whatever. So it's an abstract definition, abstract concept, but actually they are supposed to represent, in this case, maybe not apples, but a symmetry. So here's a symmetry, symmetry group. I will go into some more details on the next slide, not for this symmetry group, but for another one for ellipse, a simple, little bit easier one. So here's a symmetry group of the tetrahedron given by our reflections and rotations. It could also be the symmetry group of something else, or it could turn up as subsymmetries of something or whatever, some, some incarnation in real life, right? So in a group is kind of abstract version of a real life incarnation of a symmetry. So groups formalize this concept of symmetries, if you want, that's kind of a slow. And the goal, Maybe symmetries are really everywhere. I'm going into details in a second, but kind of, or not really details, but giving you some hints in a second, but really symmetries are everywhere. So it seems to be a reasonable goal to kind of count them. Uh, so maybe that actually makes sense. Um, count the number of different symmetries of order n. I'm not counting anything infinite here. For example, uh, a very symmetric object has a huge group associated, a huge group of symmetries. For example, the sphere, has infinitely many symmetries. Of course it does. It's kind of the most perfect object in some sense. You can rotate around any kind of axis and it, it, it will be a symmetry. And I'm going to explain what a symmetry is in a second in terms of mathematics. Um, I'm not going to study those 
Um, that's kind of out of reach. So infinite things are always a little bit complicated. I'm interested in finite, in discrete symmetries. So what are discrete symmetries? Well, I'll show you an example in a second. Okay, that would be the goal. And this is probably the goal of parts of mathematics for a long, long time. Well, mathematicians realized very, very early on that this is kind of hopeless anyway. Uh, but kind of the naive first goal, if you learn about groups, if you have uh, internalized the concept of the groups generalized symmetries, which by now is maybe 150, 160, 170 years old, roughly around that order. So it's still pretty young for mathematics, but still ancient from the viewpoint of a human being. So one, one whatever, well, let's say 150 to 200 years old, it's pretty ancient for from my perspective, and I'm ancient myself, uh, but anyway, uh, so count them, and mathematicians realized very early on that it's probably hopeless, um, and you still have this function, the well, G and U function, group number function, and it should just count, it's just really simple, de simply defined, it counts the number of symmetries of order N. So the number of different groups up to isomorphism, if you like this terminology, of a given order. I'll show you the table in a second. And well, maybe the goal is to kind of analyze that function a little bit. It doesn't sound too bad. It sounds relatively useful. You're saying something about symmetries. Uh, but it turns out that symmetries are really, really wild. And actually, this function, we don't know much about it. And it's kind of, as I said in the beginning, it's kind of very surprising in the end that you can tell something about this function which is non-trivial. Of course, you could work out some values of n. In particular, with a machine, you can do that. But a kind of a general behavior for big N is kind of mostly unknown. So it's kind of very, very random. This function behaves very, very randomly. OK, so let me just explain a little bit what the symmetry is in terms of mathematics. So here is one of my favorite examples of a symmetry uh, or, or of an object that has symmetries, this uh, Finnish street sign. I think it's a Finnish street sign. Um, and it's probably about a roundabout or something. Uh, I, I don't really know. I stole it anyway. Um, and you can see, you can literally see that it has a three-fold rotation of symmetry. Um, and how does it work? Well, a symmetry is kind of a fun concept in mathematics. A symmetry of an object is, I have my object, okay? You look away, I do some operation, and then you're allowed to look again, and you can't tell the difference. Then I've done a symmetry of the object, right? So you look at the object and you can't tell a difference after I've done my operation. That's a symmetry. Um, pretty nice concept, right? So the, the, the um, ball, for example, the sphere has infinitely many symmetries because if it would be a perfect sphere and then just turn it any way you want, um, you couldn't tell the difference. That's kind of the point of a sphere. Um, to illustrate that, it's going to come to a little bit of fun. Uh, so to illustrate the symmetry, by definition, a symmetry is something, if I do an operation, you can't tell the difference. So in order to illustrate a symmetry, I need to actually break the symmetry in order to, for you to actually see that something is going on, right? By definition, you are not allowed to see some, that something is going on, then it's a symmetry. So in order for me to actually illustrate what a symmetry is, I need to break the symmetry. So here's an example. So this Finnish street sign has a rotational symmetry by three rotations. So the trivial rotation is a symmetry. So I can do nothing, of course, uh, 120 and 240 degrees. And you can't really see that. If I would do that on the street sign here itself, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So what I, what I do here is I break the symmetry by marking one of the arrows. As soon as I mark one of the arrows, this is not, this doesn't have any rotational symmetries anymore, but you can actually now see what's going on. So the identity operation, of course, does nothing, right? The arrow goes to the arrow and everything stays fixed. 120 degrees is the 120 degree operation and 240 degrees is the 240 degree operation here, right? So it's just, it's just what you think it is, right? I said again, I broke the symmetry by coloring one of the arrows and now we can actually see those operations. By definition, a symmetry, very important, uh, is something that you actually can't tell the difference. So you need to kind of fun. This is, I, I think this is really a lot of fun. You need to break the symmetry actually in order to uh, illustrate symmetries. Anyway, so um, rotational symmetries, this, this kind of works for any, this was a triangle. Um, you can make this work for any, uh, for four gun, for five gun, six gun, seven gun, whatever. So actually this shows that um, our little group number function 
is at least one. Okay? So this is one of the very easy properties that you can read off uh, from this function. But it's at least one. Okay, yeah, because you always have at least one symmetry of one object of the corresponding one. As I said, if you want to have a group of order 12,002, you just take a 12,002 gone and its rotational symmetries and you get a group of order 12,002. And 12,002 is just a random number I came up with, which probably means it's actually not a random number. Anyway, we're not going into random numbers here. So um, for any for any n, there is at least one group. So group functions, at least one. Um, maybe you have seen the first class on group theory. Actually, without too much work, you can actually show a non-trivial fact about this group function, group number function, that the group number, the groups, the symmetries, of prime order, that's exactly one, and it is the rotational symmetry that I just showed you for a three gun, a five gun, a seven gun. Next prime number is probably 11 and 11 gun and so on. And it's not so hard. You can just take an abstract, the abstract approach to groups. It's really not so hard to show. And you might guess from there, at least naive me would, like, oh, we can probably push that a little bit further and say much more about those groups. And it turns out that um, no, I mean, you can push this abstract calculation that nu of prime is one. You can push it a bit further, but it gets really, really hard and really, really tricky. And you kind of don't do much at all in the end. So it turns out if you look at it a little bit, if you, if you try to generalize from here, that really calculating other values of, of the GNU function is really, really hard. Right? So classifying those symmetries, just writing them down, is just extremely hard. Um, and the problem is, of course, not to construct some. You can construct symmetries of objects. I just constructed for you the symmetries of this Finnish roundabout sign. I think it's a roundabout sign. Anyway, um, but to just convince yourself that there are no other symmetries of the same order, well, that's usually very, very tricky. And it's supposed to be in some sense, right? Because symmetries are literally everywhere. Um, this kind of the, the main idea here is that the symmetry doesn't need to refer to an explicit object like a triangle or a square or whatever, or what was it, a 12,000 something on, um, but rather to kind of an abstract concept. There's symmetry in music. Just look at this uh, piece of music. I let you guess what, what it is actually. Um, and it's obviously, there's obviously a symmetry going on here, right? So this piece of music has an associated symmetry group. Uh, absolutely. And people in music theory study the symmetry of music. So some links are in the description for the people for if you're interested. So the symmetry is really an abstract concept. It just turns up everywhere, not just in geometric objects. Um, another example, all of you know, probably the symmetry of uh, card shuffling. That would be the symmetric group. But again, it's the, the symmetries of a card deck. If you just put the card deck and just the, the shuffle group, um, it's also more an abstract concept of a symmetry, right? It's not really a geometric object, a card. Maybe you could count a card deck as a geometric object, but it's, not, it's certainly not a, a classical Euclidean geometry object. It's kind of a little bit of a different flavor. And really, symmetries are just everywhere. They're just everywhere in physics, in chemistry, uh, outside of the sciences, in real life, in music, in cards, everywhere. Just the human body is symmetric. At least there's this well-known symmetric axis uh, around the middle of your body, for example. Um, there's so many symmetries in real life. So um, they're just everywhere. So <sighs> computing the symmetry functions is supposed to be hard, isn't it? Because you're kind of saying, you're kind of, it's kind of the study of everything, if you want. Just a little bit hand wave, of course. It is supposed to and is. Right? So it's supposed to be very hard. Um, so it's kind of the, the story here. If you start thinking about it a little bit, you might see the first abstract steps about counting groups. And it looks doable. But actually, if you think about it, it's not supposed to be doable. And it's really not. So we don't know much about this function, which is kind of a little bit of a pity, but also kind of expected on the other hand. Um, and the big surprise, so the theorem I'm going to show you, or some facts I'm going to show you in a second, is that you can actually prove non-trivial statements about this function. Uh, so its behavior, basically its behavior uh, for n goes to infinity, if you want. Or at least for certain n as n goes to infinity. 
which is very, very surprising. It's kind of counting somehow the different number of symmetries in, a, um, in an asymptotic way, for example. So it's, it's really surprising, I think. And here's one of the surprising theorems that you can prove about the number of groups. So if you take a prime power, turns out that these are kind of the main players in some sense, I'm going to illustrate it in a second, and then you can actually write down an asymptotic formula. So this is an asymptotic formula, right? So it's, it's not saying that the group number of P to the K is equal to, but for everything big enough here, it's roughly of that size. Don't look too close at the formula itself. It's not so important. The point is there is a formula, right? So you can actually kind of uh, approximate the asymptotic behavior of this, um, of this function, which is really a pattern in the sea of randomness, as I said here. And actually, you could say a little bit more, and this would be a lot of fun uh, to explore. Um, it turns out, so you might wonder here, okay, there's a P to the K. Why on earth should I care about P to the K? Um, and actually, the most important one is 2 to the K because it's just the smallest one. It appears here. Why on earth should I care about those? Um, turns out, it's very fun. It's, it's amazing. It's mind-blowing. It's a very fun fact about groups is that most groups are actually of order 2 to the K. In some sense, uh, so here I've plotted the uh, the value of the of this function up to one thousand, and it's as you can see, it's basically flat. It's basically constant. You don't really see the difference. I will zoom in into a nicer picture in a second. You basically can't tell the difference, um, except at two to the nine, you have this huge peak. Uh, so at five hundred and twelve, which just sticks out. And there's another one at two to the eight times three, which is a little bit smaller. But for example, um, just I, I just did the count here, just did it with Mathematica. Link is in the description how you, how you can actually make some count up to a certain number. And there are quite a few groups of order be, below one thousand, so there are quite a few symmetries, and um, almost all of them, almost all of them are groups of order two to the nine, right? So this roughly, let's say, eleven point five million in total uh, groups, and you have 10.5 million uh, just of order to, for 512, which is just ridiculous. This is kind of true in general. So almost all groups, almost all symmetries are of prime, uh, of prime power order, so in particular of two to the K, because kind of two to the K is the first one you actually see uh, if, you, if you just, two to the K is just so much smaller than three to the K, right? Okay, so let's zoom in into the tab Mathematica table a little bit more in detail. So here on the right-hand side, uh, this you can actually do yourself because it's linked in the description. So here is the table of the number of groups. So how do you read it? Well, uh, groups of order one, groups of order two, groups of order three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. So these are the groups, the number of groups, the GNU function, our group number function, up to 100. And as you can see, it looks pretty random. But at prime powers, so here is my little prime power, uh, 46, uh, yeah, 46. And it's, it has by far the biggest number here uh, turning up on this table. Here's another big one. And let's get this, of course, uh, uh, 32 times 3. It's one of those again. It's kind of the same, same type of pattern. Um, so how does this table work? Well, you can make it bigger or smaller. So let's make it a little bit smaller. Um, so here, the first groups up to order 36. And as you can see, the by far biggest number appears for power of two, which is this one. Um, the, the funny boxes are those where all groups are commutative. So um, of course, if you just have one group, then it's commutative because it's a group of rotations. Um, but it, yeah, well, there's quite a few at least it looks like where all groups are commutative. So the first case where not all groups are commutative is of order six. You have two groups of order six and one of them is non-commutative. Um, and here, of course, of the 51, almost nothing is commutative. But point is, this is pretty random. There are a lot of ones, a lot of twos, and fives, and 15, and 14, and 51. You can make it a bit bigger here. I'm going to this huge table. As you can see here, this is by far the biggest number. And of course, it's a, it's a power of two that appears. Well, this one, this is a pattern of the sea of randomness. Otherwise, it's basically random. It's 13, 15, 52, 10, 12, random. That's, whole, that's the whole problem with this function. It's 
pretty much random. And then there's this beautiful, beautiful patterns in the sea of randomness. Okay, so this is pretty amazing, right? So the point is symmetries are really, really wild. So you should expect this function to be random and it mostly is, and then you can tell at least something about this function, like this asymptotic rows uh, for prime powers and some observations along the line that for two, for powers of two, almost all groups are in some sense, uh, groups of powers of two. Okay, um, just to wrap up, there are a lot of conjectures related to this function that probably nobody can prove. So, or nobody will prove anytime soon and we are in 2022. So I don't expect any real progress uh, on those questions. It's just, it's just too, too hard, right? So trees are everywhere. So what else can you do here? And, but anyway, so you can hunt. So it's called hunting news um, from stolen from a very nice paper linked in the description. So as you can see here, um, there's this conjecture in this paper that every positive, of course, there should be a positive integer. Everything else doesn't make sense. But every positive integer is actually a group number. It means it appears as an output of the group of the group function. So there is some n such that, uh, so let's, let's call this positive number x. And there exists some n such as our little function here just spits out x, right? So that's kind of the point. Conjecture, and that's probably true, but uh, I, I'm pretty certain, maybe in, uh, I'm kind of, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I'm kind of convinced that there won't be any proof in my lifetime because it's just just too complicated, probably. Um, and it kind of tells you that this is really is random. So any, any number will appear at one point. So I did a count again. Um, so again, I'm counting the occurrences here using Mathematica of K among the first thousand. So uh, for for n, uh, n smaller than a thousand. And the first one, it doesn't appear as 19. So 19 doesn't appear. Um, you need to make it bigger and 19 actually will appear. But among the first 10,000, 19 is the smallest number that doesn't appear as an output of the function itself. Um, and as you can see, this is really biased. I mean, we have seen that in the Mathematica table, right? It looks like most numbers are one, two, and then something funny happens and I don't have any explanation. There are almost no threes. And then there's a four, a five, a six, and they kind of behave uh, nicely. But the threes, there's almost no, no threes. That's kind of really weird. If anyone has an explanation for that, I would be, it would be lovely to hear it. I've never seen anything like this. I just listed them and I realized uh, there are some threes, so it's not like there are no threes, but th they're not, not many compared to the others. Kind of really, really fun. I don't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, and otherwise it looks a little bit like, like, like there's this curve like this. And at one point, well, 19 is the first one. It doesn't appear, but you make the, the N here a little bit bigger and it actually will appear. And this conjecture, as far as I know, has been verified for X up to whatever it is, 10 million or so. Um, so it's probably true, but proving it will also probably take quite a while. Um, probably not, as I said, anymore in my lifetime. Although you shouldn't say that because nobody knows what the future brings, of course. Uh, so let me wrap up. So the groups, the abstract concept of symmetry, we would like to count them. And it turns out that it's kind of a sea of randomness in front of us. And it's kind of very funny that you can say or very surprising, maybe that's the correct word, that you can actually say something about it. So it looks like there's just no way you say anything about it, but actually you can, like this, this funny pattern about the asymptotic behavior. And then there are some very, very easy formulated and very, very hard to prove conjectures about it. Um, so I, for example, totally believe that the conjecture that any number is a group number is true. I have no idea how to prove it, absolutely no idea. And I, I don't think there's any, there's much progress going on right now. Just one of those questions you can ask about symmetries. Very natural, probably uh, no way that this can ever be proven. And there's kind of, kind of some random behavior going on as, as, as you've seen in my little plot. Uh, so the number three, I have no idea what's going on. Maybe you need to zoom out much more and the number three will catch up with all of the others. Maybe the number three is just more complicated. I have no idea. But there was this dropping down at the number three, which I have no explanation for. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.